Okay, so it's a great pleasure today to have David Bridges from the University of British Columbia, actually located in, uh, in Maine now, and he's going to, to tell us about class expansion and lace expansion. I guess the, the title has just disappeared, so... Ah, sorry. David. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> lace expansions and spin models, yes. Right. David. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, well, certainly for inviting me, uh, including me in this series and uh, for being here today. I see many old friends here in the participants. Um, so I'm going to uh, um, talk about three topics uh, and Basically, the first two are old story, and I apologize for those of you who've heard it probably 50,000 times, but they, the way I'll do them does set the stage very nicely, I think, for the last part, which is new. So um, let me start. Uh, I want to put the LACE expansion into the context of other expansions that are used in mathematical physics, especially the Meyer expansion, because it is a re close relative. So let's look at the problem of hard spheres in a subset, finite subset lambda of the lattice set D. And I've just put three spheres, three hard spheres in this picture here. Uh, and I'm emphasizing that they each have a label, like that could be label one, label two, label three. Uh, and they each have a position, x1, x2, x3, inside this finite lattice. And then you have this grand canonical ensemble, uh, the sum over the number of particles, n. There's a weight, z, for each particle, commonly called the activity. Then you sum the particle. So you see x is in lambda n here, meaning it's an n-tuple of x's. You sum, sum the positions of the particles over lambda. And here is what I'll call the interaction. It's the condition that none of these red spheres overlap. Now, um, I think I've drawn these red spheres large enough so that you can see that if two of them were nearest neighbors, they would overlap. Um, and uh, if they're further than nearest neighbors, then they won't. <clears throat> so... Uh, let's see what to do with this. So the Meyer expansion, which goes back to like 1949, well, at least the book, it goes back earlier than that, actually, into the 30s, uh, Joseph Meyer, um, uh, married to Maria Gertfurt Meyer, who was a Nobel Prize winning chemist. Uh, but uh, Joseph introduced these expansions, and his uh, starting point in the terms of the model we're looking at is inclusion-exclusion. Namely, you write the uh, condition, the indicator function, that no particles overlap as a product for each pair uh, of one minus they do overlap. So let me introduce the notation here. The K is the complete graph on the labels of the particles, not the positions, but the labels. And the uh, F is, as I said, the indicator function that uh, particle I overlaps with particle J. And then Meyer expanded this, so this is also what you do with inclusion, exclusion. Um, you expand this using a kind of binomial theorem where uh, when you multiply out this product, some of the terms, one subset of, of uh, the particles uh, gets one, weight one, and the other set, subset of the particles gets minus Fij. And that subset, which gets these guys, I'm going to call G. It's a set of pairs of particles, and I'll think of that as a set of edges on the complete within the complete graph. And for each edge in the complete, uh, for each edge in this selected set G, uh, you have this factor, which tells you that those particles have to overlap in pairwise. 
And then I want to introduce a notation for this because I'm going to have to write that formula several times. And so I'm going to define this product to be f to the power of g, or actually minus f to the power of g. And this equality, that the indicator function of no overlap is equal to this sum over graphs of minus f to the power of g, I'm going to use that backwards in a little while. So uh, remember that for when I get there. Now here's Meyer's first theorem. Uh, I put in red uh, the things that correspond. You see the log here, and you see here that G is in some other class of graphs, not just subsets of K. It's uh, all C, this uh, calligraphic C is all connected graphs with vertices uh, 1 to N. And... Um, if I were to replace that by summing over all graphs, then I would have the partition function. So there's this miraculous, well-known thing in combinatorics that passing from the set of all graphs, which might be disconnected or connected, just to the set of connected graphs is equivalent to taking the logarithm of the partition function. And then this is an ex power series expansion. So N here is a actually a function of the graph. We're going to sum over graphs with one vertex, two vertices, three vertices, and the n looks at the graph and tells you how many vertices it has in it, even though I don't put that dependence in this formula. And, sorry, damn. Um, this wiggly sign here means that this is just a formal power series. We don't know whether it converges or not yet. So that's what we're off to find out now, or to prove. Oh, well, before I do that, uh, let me try and give you some feeling for this expansion, because it'll help later in the other context. Um, and then I, was, uh, I want to just uh, show you uh, what, those, what it means. Um, so when you're summing over G, the first graph, which is connected, is a single vertex. That's that guy there and there are no edges to show, and that represents just a single particle. <clears throat> the next graph uh, is two vertices, and there's one edge between them, because it has to be connected. And uh, what does this edge mean? Well, you remember that it means that this particle, the position of that part, the sphere which this particle represents, this label represents, has to overlap with the sphere that this label represents. So it's a pair of particles bound together into a two cluster. And similarly, you have uh, a three cluster, these guys, and that's a, a three cluster even more tightly bound because you can have any graph on these things. And uh, I drew three of these tree graphs here because uh, you see, you can think of this as particle one, particle two, particle three. And uh, then you have to sum over all the ways you can put edges on these labeled particles. That's what we're summing over is labeled graphs. Now, uh, Gronveld, uh, I, it was his thesis, which was a lot earlier than 1962, but I think it's first published in 1962. He shows that after dividing by the volume, the number of, part, the number of uh, lattice points inside the finite set lambda, this power series in Z or Z, uh, converges uniformly in lambda, no matter how loud, large lambda is, provided the Z is small. So um, let's take a look at one of the proofs of this, which is the one that leads to the lace expansion. Uh, so this is a, a proof that Penrose introduced in 1967. Um, and his idea is that you can reduce the, num the connected graphs to tree graphs. That's very important because there are way too many connect connected graphs for you to be able to prove that the series is absolutely convergent as a sum over graphs. Um, but uh, we can do this thing of, uh, uh, I mean, as a power series in Z, let me emphasize, that's what we're going to try to prove it converges. But each coefficient in that power series is the sum of many graphs. 
And if you tried to just say that it was bounded by the sum of all the graphs without regard to their sign, just absolute values, then you would be way divergent. Uh, and so we have to sum the graphs with the cancellations uh, that happen between them. And Penrose introduced this way of doing this. So his claim is that you can find a map K, which I'll show you what it is later, um, which maps connected graphs into tree graphs. Each connected graph is associated with a tree graph. And for each tree graph, you can characterize the inverse image under this map. So there exists a graph M, which stands for maximal. It's, of course, dependent on T. And the set of graphs that map to this tree under this map K is the set of all graphs which are sandwiched between the tree graphs. So they contain the tree graph as a subset, and they're inside this capital M as a maximal graph depending on T. So it's an interval of graphs in that sense. This is sub, subset here just means subgraph, meaning it has the same vertices, but a subset of the edges. Now I'm going to show you Penrose's resummation. It's very simple. Um, the sum over all connected graphs of this factor minus f to the power of g, which you remember is a product over uh, indicator functions, is equal to the sum over trees followed by the sum over the graphs that connect to trees. That has nothing to do with what you're summing. That's just the pigeonhole principle that if you want to sum over the set calligraphic C, you can divide it up into equivalence classes, uh, which is what I'm doing here. And the equivalence classes are labeled by T and I'm summing over the elements of the equivalence class and then sum over the equivalence classes. Now, the next thing I do is I say that since G contains T, when it's in this equivalence class, I can factor out the part of this product here into the tree graph part. And then uh, I've written the sum over G prime and G prime is the part of the graph G that isn't the tree. It's all the edges which isn't the tree and therefore it's inside the maximal graph here minus the tree. It's kind of relabeling the uh, sum. And then we rewrite this. There's this part here is exactly the same. And suddenly this sum over here has become one minus indicator function raised to the power of M without T. And guess what we use to do that? We use the graph expansion that I explained a couple of pages back backwards. So this is inclusion exclusion written backwards and then you notice that one minus an indicator function is always going to be either zero or one uh, because fij is in this interval here and um, well actually fij either is zero or one so the complement this is the complementary indicator function so in a way what we've done is reconstruct or what penrose has done is reconstruct some of the uh, uh, original indicator function that various things can't overlap. And we've reduced the sum over all graphs to the sum over just tree graphs. Then you have this wonderful inequality here at the bottom here, and it comes about, we've used this identity we've just proved, the sum over uh, minus F to the power of a graph is the sum over trees to the power of a tree and this additional factor here, which we just saw. And we use the fact that this is less than one in order to bound this sum here in absolute value by the sum over, and the absolute values here are actually redundant because F is non-negative, it's an indicator function. So the sum over all graphs is less than the sum over tree graphs, which looks a bit peculiar, but it's true. That's in fact taking into account all of those cancellations that uh, I was worried about earlier. And this formula then easily implies that the expansion of one over lambda log Z 
i.e. the pressure or beta times the pressure, is convergent uniformly in lambda for z small. And uh, once again, the problem we were up against is that there are roughly two to the one half n squared connected graphs, but there are only n to the n minus two tree graphs. The n to the n minus two is about the same as a factorial. And we have a factorial because in this formula back here, there, you see that factorial. So that's why you can prove it's convergent. Okay. All right. Well, I, I hope you've understood how that works because I'm going to use it one more time and then I'm going to kind of rely on it one more time, not quite use it, but motivate by it. So the next thing we have to do uh, is to just see why there is a K. And uh, well, actually, I won't really explain why there's a K, but I'll just tell you what it is because I'm in a bit of a hurry. Um, so here's the complete graph on five vertices. And the complete graph is, is uh, every other graph we're interested in, remember, is a subgraph. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to order the edges of this complete graph. And it doesn't matter how you order it, any way you like. So choose an order. There's an order. You don't have to remember it. Um, all the graphs inherit this order on their edges, all the subgraphs. So here is a subgraph one of the G's that I want to assign a tree to, a connected graph. And it's inherited its uh, order on the edges. Now, the map K is generated by an algorithm. And the algorithm is to pick the edges in this graph in the order, discarding the edges whenever they form a loop. So for example, the first edge is this one here. I pick it, and the second edge is four, next largest edge, and the next one is five. And after that, I should select six, being the next one, but that would close a loop, so I discard it, and I select the one after that instead. And now I have a tree, but in principle, you can complete, you can continue trying to select edges, but you'll never be able to add any of them because everyone will close a loop. That is the map K taking the original graph G into the red subgraph T. And that, what, that map does satisfy this Penrose property that the inverse image is a, um, uh, uh, the inverse image is an interval of graphs. And uh, basically what you do to uh, find this capital, this maximal graph M, is you start asking yourself which edges in the complete graph could I add to this red graph without violating the uh, way that the Kruskal algorithm was uh, carried out. And uh, I've shown you what the edges actually are in case you want to play with this later. It's every edge except the yellow ones, and I'm explaining it very rapidly there, but I'll go over that and uh, you can ask me about that at the end of the talk if you're hard up for a question and you just have to ask one. Um, now we're going on to self-avoiding walk, and I'm checking the time, and I see that it's going past incredibly fast. Um, but I did start five minutes later, right? Yeah, you, you can have a few more minutes. Because there was also the interruption. So at least okay, I, I think I'll need them <laughs> at this rate. <laughs> Here we have uh, a, a, what a, now we're going to talk about... Uh, uh, lace expansion for self-avoiding walk based on what you've just seen. Um, so I've drawn a walk here. A walk is just a sequence of a finite sequence of nearest neighbors. Uh, N is the number of steps in the walk now instead of the number of particles. Um, and the walk is taking place uh, actually on the infinite lattice for the purposes of this uh, segment of the talk. So I, I've drawn a finite set there, but it's actually the whole lattice that I'm talking about. Now, instead of the partition function, we're going to apply the previous idea to the Green's function. And the Green's function is defined like this. Um, first, it depends on a lattice point x. It's uh, a function of a lattice point x. 
and x appears here, and this omega is this set of n step walks that end at x, and you have to sum over them. But you also have to sum over the number of steps in the walk, and for each step, you put a factor, uh, actually for each step plus one extra, you put a factor of z. <clears throat> so a walk of zero length, which is just a walker who stops and who starts and stops at the same place, uh, gets a factor of z. And then here is something you'll recognize. Um, this is the interaction again. Uh, it is Again, the product over all uh, pairs of, uh, um, I mean, the, the X is the, the, uh, in that walk there, uh, you see the labels, zero, one, and so on. It's the labels on the omega naught, omega one, omega two. Uh, so for every pair, we have the condition. Well, it's not actually, because of this G here, it's not an indicator function anymore. But if that G was one, this would be the indicator function that you're not at the same place at time i. I'm going to call this label time uh, here, discrete time. You're not at the same position at time i as you are at time j. So that would be, a, uh, when you take the product, that would make the walk self-avoiding. But we make it weakly self-avoiding just so that I can uh, get through this uh, uh, quickly and uh, set the stage for other things. So it's a simpler model, but um, it's uh, what we're going to look at. Okay, Z is non-negative. could be zero. This is a new parameter, this G. So we have two parameters. The G, which is the strength of self-avoiding, uh, this is called weakly self-avoiding. If G was zero, you wouldn't be self-avoiding at all. It would be the uh, simple random, random walk. Um, and uh, then another thing is which we need is we need to look at the sum of this Green's function over X, which means you'd be summing over all walks that start at the origin but go anywhere they feel like. And that's called the susceptibility. chi. And then we define the critical activity to be the supremum of the, uh, well, uh, the supremum over the z's here, such that this is finite. So it's the radius of convergence of the power series in z. And then there's this proposition um, which doesn't look very exciting. Uh, for dimension greater or equal to 5 and g small, uh, the Green's function at x is bounded by, uh, at the critical Green's function at x, is bounded by twice the free Green's function. Notice uh, by putting a 0 here, that means g is 0, and the free Green's function, this term is just product is 1, and you're looking at simple random walk. So the critical Green's function is bounded by twice the, um, uh, the simple random walk Green's function. <clears throat> and this is called an infrared bound, and it's a key step in proving more exciting things like that the Green's function is asymptotic to a constant that you can calculate inverse power of x to the d minus 2. The, this looks like the free Green's function asymptotic decay. And many other results, uh, and these are all discussed in detail in uh, uh, this well-known book. Now, uh, for us, uh, we look at uh, this factor here, and we do the same thing as before. Uh, we recognize, uh, sorry, uh, we recognize that this thing here is the set of edges in the complete graph. Uh, and now I'm going to draw the complete graph like this, because I think of the edges as a timeline. Uh, zero time, one time, two, uh, two time, and so on. Time, time zero, time one, time two. 
And into the Green's function, which is, in, in other words, for this factor, we again substitute, and here I'm using that notation, 1 minus f to the k is just my notation for this big product here, because uh, that's the uh, all ages in the complete graph, uh, is equal to the same Meyer expansion, uh, sum over all subgraphs of k of uh, indicator function raised to the power of g, actually minus indicator function. So um, here it is the same formula again. And when I expand it into graphs, in other words, I apply that identity uh, to the um, sum over all graphs of this, uh, this thing. Um, I've got the same notation as before, by the way. I'm summing over graphs, all graphs, like this one here. Um, and the n is a uh, looks at the graph and uh, sees how long it is. So this graph is n, has n vertices. So it sees that this is the number of vertices in the graph as before, and this is the uh, sum uh, over for each edge in the graph, a condition that at this time and at this time the walker at the same place. Now. There are some points here, some, some uh, labels here or times here, which have no arches over them. That one certainly doesn't, the zero, but I, I'm going to uh, exclude that from consideration. I'm trying to define a notion of a, of a label being Markovian, and uh, that's excluded from this uh, discussion. This is Markovian. There's no arch over it. This is Markovian. There's no arch over it. These are not. This is Markovian. There are lots of arches over it. Um, and then again, I haven't put in all the Markovian arches, but um, uh, this would be, uh, this would be, this would be, and this would be. So that is how to define Markovian arch and Markovian times. And then we say, that G is in calligraphic C, so that was formerly connected graphs, and this is a new notion of connectedness, if G has no Markovian points. <clears throat> and now we define pi as before. Um, or actually, no, sorry, we haven't defined this before, have we? This is, uh, so let me back up on this. Um, what we're defining is something a little, which is a little bit analogous to the log of the partition function. You remember I started this discussion of self-avoiding walk by saying we replace the partition function by the Green's function. Uh, it's a kind of one-dimensional partition function in the language I've been using because time is the uh, labels the vertices. Uh, now, instead of the log of the partition function, we're going to, uh, uh, corresponding to a sum over connected graphs, something else will uh, correspond to the sum over connected graphs. So this is just a definition. Don't sum over all graphs, which will give you the Green's function, as we have down here. Sum over the, I'm calling them connected graphs, but I mean graphs with no Markovian points. Sum over graphs with no Markovian points of the same thing, and then you will have what's called pi. And here is why pi is useful. Pi is a solution to this convolution equation. This is convolution in the X. It says that the full Green's function is equal to the simple random walk Green's function, which you get by putting G equal to zero. Thus, the simple random walk Green's function convolved into this new thing called pi, convolved into the full Green's function. Some people call this a Schwinger-Dyson equation, just to intimidate you. This thing replaces the connection is being replaced by 
this formula instead. And you should think of it as what you get by solving this. I don't want to discuss at the moment whether you can solve this equation, but later, of course, we'll prove you can. And so I'm going to anticipate that and say, let's think of this as G, this, uh, this formula. So it, you, you formally solve it by just getting all the Gs on one side and everything else on the other, um, all the interacting Gs. And G is equal to the inverse of, what is this, minus Laplacian? Well, that's the inverse of the simple random walk greens function. And if Z were one, then it would be truly the ordinary lattice Laplacian. And if Z is not one, but less than one, then it's the uh, uh, regular lattice, it's the, it has the same matrix as the lattice Laplacian off diagonal, but the um, uh, diagonal uh, becomes dominant. It's uh, larger than the uh, sum of the entries off diagonal. <clears throat> so I'm going to, instead of using this, I'm, I'm kind of going to invite you to think of it as this instead. And the point is, that you see, if we can learn about pi and prove that it's a small perturbation of this Laplacian here, then this guy will be well approximated by, let's say, pi being zero. So how can we do that? It's again one of these expansions. And we're going to have a, a Penrose K again. And we're going to map the graphs with non-Markovian vertices into, with non, no uh, Markovian vertices, into a new class of graphs called laces. So, here I've drawn a connected graph. And I'm going to show you how you select a subgraph inside it. So this is what takes the place of the Kruskal algorithm. So what you do is you start at this vertex and you look for the edge that reaches as far as possible into the future. It's that one. And you color it red. Now we look at all of the vertices that are underneath that arch and you look for all the edges that lead from underneath that arch and go into the future. And you try to find the one that goes as far as possible into the future. And I think it is, I think there are actually two. And I think uh, it's, um, I'm sorry, I, I think I went too far. Let me back up a second. You look at all of these vertices and you look at the edges that goes you try to find the edge that goes from one of these vertices as far as possible into the future. And I select that one, but I could also have selected this one here, right? Well, uh, you have to just make a decision. And my, uh, so this is kind of a slightly artificial thing. Uh, um, you break this tie just by always taking the longest arch. Now, having got two arches, you look at all of these vertices which are covered by the two arches and you look for the arch that reaches as far as possible from one of them into the future. And actually, you don't have to look at all of those because you kind of already took care of that when you look, took the longest one from that part already. So you only actually have to look at this one, this one, this one, and this one. And... I think it's this one that goes as far as possible. And finally, you look underneath uh, these, this arch and you find the one that goes as far as possible into the future and you're finished now. You reach the end of the uh, number of labels. This red thing is called a lace. And the set of laces is all the, th all the things that have this structure. Let me define them like this. Uh, you say that L belongs to the calligraphic L, the set of laces, if L is non, has no Markovian labels and the removal of any edge from L creates Markovian vertices. 
Um, this is very like the tree situation. The thing about trees is that if you removed any edge from a tree, it would no longer be connected. And here, it's a similar situation. If you remove any edge from a lace, it will no longer be connected in the sense that there will now be not Mar the Markovian labels. And then this lemma, let K has the, Markov the Penrose property. And uh, so you have this resummation yet again. All right. So same, same uh, Penrose resummation. Different idea of what graphs are and what uh, the subgraphs that we're going to replace. The sum over all the graphs, which is again an enormous uh, fast growing th function of the number of labels, is replaced by the sum of of uh, laces, um, which there are much fewer. And we have this minus F to the L is a condition that particles have to be at the same places uh, in a certain way that's described by the edges of the lace. And this factor here so is a, uh, says that there can't be the, the, uh, comp the edges which are not, not in L, but are in the maximal graph that comes that is defined by L. And now uh, I'd like to explain the first place where this expansion allows you to do something that we did not do. Maybe it's possible to do it, but I don't know how to do it. Uh, for the Meyer expansion, it's hard to do anything with this factor here other than say it's less than one. But here we can do something. Instead of just bounding it by one, I'm going to keep some of the uh, edges. And so this big mess that I've drawn here is some but not all the edges in the maximal graph defined by this red lace. It's, um, I haven't drawn them all because it would make this an enormous diagram, but the ones I've drawn are sort of important. First, let's focus on these dashed ones, which are the most important. I've drawn them underneath just so that you can see them clearly, but notice that um, they have the property that they never cross over one of these uh, places where an arch ends. So, for example, this, I could add or not add this edge uh, to the red lace without violating the condition that it is still the red lace for the new graph I get by adding this on, because uh, I would not use this edge when I'm executing that algorithm that I just talked about. And I can add this edge too. Or I cannot add it. And the choice of adding it or not adding it is why you get a 1 minus F, because it's that resummation that I was talking about uh, using, uh, using the uh, graph expansion backwards. And the same is true for all of these, all of these edges here. Um, they, none of these edges cross over. Um, I mean, they're all within this subinterval. So let me say it this way. The red graph defines subintervals. Here's one subinterval between the first where this red arch begins and where this red arch begins. Here is another subinterval between where this one arch begins and that arch ends. Here's another subinterval, another one, another one, another one, and so on. These dotted lines stay within their subintervals. Whereas these lines, which in fact I could also add uh, without violating the condition that this is still the lace uh, defined by for this bigger graph, if I add that edge, uh, it goes over an endpoint of an, of an arch. So I've drawn those ones above and I'm going to just, they're, part, they're included in this product over one minus F and since one minus F is less than one, I can actually throw those factors away. Those are indicator functions, which uh, uh, one minus F means they're less than, they're indicator functions 
that this at this time the walk here has to um, avoid the position when it's at at this time, I can just throw away that condition. And uh, uh, this uh, whole graph in absolute value will only get bigger. And uh, so when I throw it away, but keeping all of these, I get a much nicer situation where um, within each subinterval, I've reconstructed the self-avoiding condition. The dash subgraph, so uh, the dash subgraph means take one minus f and, and uh, for every edge in the dash subgraph, keep the factor one minus f. And I now have a bound on pi. I take, it's the sum over all laces. So I'm applying, I'm applying, I'm applying this to bound pi. It's the sum over all laces, sum over all walks that end in X, conditions that the lace enforces on the, what the walk has to do, and a self-avoiding factor for the walk restricted to each of those sub-intervals. 1 minus F to the dash, power of the dash graph is the self-avoiding interaction on sub-intervals. Now, uh, I look at what this bound for pi actually is in terms of what the walk is doing. If you have the graph, the lace, which is a single arch, that forces the walk at this time to be at the same place as it is at this time. So the walk is doing a little loop and coming back to where it started. This big black uh, dot here means the starting point of the walk. So this means the walk is forced to return. But it's a self-avoiding walk that's forced to return, or actually a weakly self-avoiding walk that's forced to return. That's why it can return. Um, it's a, a weakly self-avoiding walk is forced to return to where it started. Here we have a walk that's doing something like this. It's starting at the origin. It's going to some other point, which is fixed for the moment, which will sum over. And then coming back to where it started and then going back to there. And similarly, this one, this one, this one, this one. And on each of these edges, it's self-avoiding. So the walk from here to here must not self-intersect, but it could, it could intersect with uh, these over here. The self-avoiding condition is only restricted to each of these sub-intervals, which corresponds to these walks, uh, this walk is self-avoiding, this walk is self-avoiding, but can intersect that, and so on. Actually, I, I threw away those conditions uh, when I threw away the black lines in the previous oh, page. David, oh, David, 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 yes, David, yes. The, the, the lace in the, in the sec second one, second in the left, one. This the left one? you should have two, two bonds. Oh, uh, yes, it looks like, it, I'm sorry, I, you're quite right. I, that should have two arches. Thank you for that correction. In fact, I... Bizarre, I made that correction and now it's, <laughs> never mind, my problem. Um, uh, okay, yes, two arches there for that one, sorry. And three arches, because the, the, the number of arches is the number of vertices, because each edge up here creates a vertex in what the walk does. It creates a return for the walk. And then we have pi, and now I put these colored Gs on the, uh, uh, on the edges. And what do I mean by that? Well, remember, this was a self-avoiding walk that returned to its origin. Uh, but you have to sum over all the self-avoiding walks. And the sum over all the walks is actually the Green's function that I wish I, I was trying to, you know, remember, I'm trying to prove infrared bound on the Green's function. So the Green's, this is the Green's function. And same thing here, I get a Green's function. So these are actually Feynman diagrams where uh, each edge is now associated with the Green's function, and you have to sum over the positions of the uh, uh, of the endpoints of the or the uh, arguments of the Green's functions all glued together according to this graph. And there's a factor of g for each vertex because uh, we put that in in front of the indicator function when we define the model. And now, um, now we have. Uh, 
But we wanted, remember, I, I wanted to prove to you this uh, infrared bound, which shows that the Green's function at the critical G, at the critical uh, Z is bounded by twice the free Green's function. And here's the argument. Of course, there are many details missing, which uh, you can see in this uh, uh, recent paper, which made it all very simple. Um, so if you, your dimension is bigger than five, your coupling constant is small, and the Z is less than the critical Z, remember it's positive uh, or non-negative. Um, well, then we have the following extraordinary statement. The Green's function at X for this Z, one of these Zs, is bounded by three, I mean, if, sorry, if the Green's function is bounded by three times the free Green's function, the simple random walk Green's function, and you combine that with the knowledge that G is equal to this formula involving pi, and you put in the bound on pi, so you see pi is bounded by a series involving Green's functions. We know something about the Green's function. It's a hypothesis that we just give ourselves. This, If it's less than three times the the free Green's function, and you stick that bound in for pi, you can then prove that pi is small compared with the Laplacian. And you can then show that this uh, interacting Green's function uh, is well approximated in, and has the same asymptotic behavior as the inverse of just the Laplacian without that. And then you can use this formula because you can make this this perturbation as small as you like by using this hypothesis, g small, you can use this formula to show that the bound by three times the Green's function, the free Green's function, implies the bound by two times the free Green's function. So three implies two in this bound. Now the next statement is that if your Z is smaller is sufficiently small, and how small? Well, it should be smaller than the um, uh, the critical point for the simple random walk Green's function, which is just one over two times the dimension, one tenth in five dimensions. If it's that small, it's easy to prove that the Green's function is bounded by twice uh, the uh, free Green's function. So we put this statement together with this statement. It's like a deformation argument in Z. For Z sufficiently small, you have the bound you're trying to prove. Now you start to make Z a little larger. Make it get larger and larger. Let it tend towards the critical Z for the interacting Green's function. Now as it gets larger, you ask, can this bound ever be violated? Well, if there's continuity, there'd come a point where it is violated, say, the Green's function is bounded by two and a half times the interacting Green's, the non-interacting Green's function. But that's impossible. This formula here says if it's bounded by three, it's bounded by two. So it can never get across this forbidden gap if you have continuity. And so continuity in Z, if you have it, will imply that you have this bound by two for all Z, which are less than critical. And if you have a slightly stronger statement about continuity, which is given by the monotone convergence theorem in the in the in the applied to the uh, power series that defines the interacting Green's function. You'll also get it actually at the critical point, and that's uh, that is my complete completes my sketch of the proof of the infrared bound. Once you have the infrared bound, you can put that back into the pi, and then prove for g small that this thing is well approximated by 1 over the Laplacian. And that's how you get, but it's, much, it's quite difficult, that's how you get the um, statement uh, that I boasted about uh, earlier about the interacting Green's function being asymptotic to the free Green's function with a constant in front. 
OK, now we come to n-component spin models. So first, what class of spin models uh, am I going to allow? Well, um, this thing here, let's uh, make a definition. First, what am I defining? What am I doing? For every point in a finite set lambda, um, I'm going to have a spin taking its values in Rn. So it's a, a vector with n components for each point for each uh, uh, site in the lattice, in the finite piece of the lattice. Um, so I'm going to call that collection of fields big phi. And then uh, phi, any element of that is a function on the lattice. And uh, I've got the near, usual nearest neighbor interaction here. Um, you take the sum of uh, the edges associated with lambda, the edges which tell you whether they're nearest neighbors or not. And the, here is the finite difference uh, gradient squared. Now, actually, uh, you should define some boundary conditions. And that's what I'm doing when I say union symmetry. But I'll, I'll, I'll allow those who know what I mean to know what I mean, and those who don't to just ignore this. Um, and um, uh, another thing I should say is that actually in our theorem, which I'll state in a moment, you don't have to have nearest neighbor edges. You can have any finite range edges. Now we have uh, what counts as the interaction in this context, because um, interaction here counts with but what I'm thinking is of, as the non-interacting model is the case where V is zero and we're just looking at uh, what the partition function for the massless free field. Um, so V, uh, let's think of the example where V of uh, this argument, which I'll call S for a moment, is uh, a coupling constant times the square of S plus nu times S. Um, that's just the five-fourth theory. Let me just that's the phi four field theory because if you square one half phi squared as I am here, I get g times phi to the fourth. Here is a definition. Here is the definition of the two point function. Uh, I've put this subscript superscript lambda to remind us that we're in finite volume. Uh, so, and I put this dot product here because these are n vectors, and I take their uh, pro dot product as n vectors. So there's one at A, one at B, and I take the dot product. Um, if you like, the cosine of the angle between them. Uh, now, this um, is the observable, so that's there. And everything else is exactly the same, and that's the normalization. Now we define a perturbation of the normalization, which consists of just adding 2Tx to this, it's the same as that, except for the plus 2t of x. And these are parameters, these t's. And there's going to be one for every site x. And they're just non-negative numbers. So this boldface t is a whole collection of non-negative uh, numbers assigned to sites in, uh, uh, in uh, lambda. And uh, I'll make some claims about the n equals zero model in the theorem. And uh, this is the Edwards model in the case that we have here. You, it's just the same formula as this, except you don't have any fields. You only keep the part that you get um, uh, by, basically by adding that on. And you just uh, set the, that to zero, get rid of all of these things. Just keep that part and put that equal to the local time of the law. Uh, so that's that's called the Edwards. The con that's called the continuous time Edwards model. Um, don't worry about it if it's confusing you right now. Okay, now um, this T is a kind of background, and as well as the partition function being perturbed as by this, I can also define a expectation where both the, where the, this is 
this thing is included and in also the uh, normalization includes it. Here, yeah, that's what I'm doing right here. So this background of, t of, of times uh, is substituted, uh, uh, is, a, is this change from phi squared to, uh, oh, there should be no two there. I'm so sorry. Um, I made a, let me make a correction there. Um, there should be no two. I put the I put the two which I was thinking about in the one half instead. Sorry about that. So it's one half phi squared plus t x. Those of you who aren't so familiar with it, um, uh, if you look at e to the minus this polynomial, the five fourth polynomial, uh, and you look at it. Uh, the graph of this exponential, uh, and you plot it as a function of the absolute value of phi, uh, or the uh, norm of phi, if it's an n vector, you get this Mexican hat potential in the case of an n vector. It concentrates, what it does is it concentrates the um, model onto a rotator model where the phi is forced to have that length, or that uh, is forced to have this length here. I drew this other arch, even though I'm, even though this can't be negative, because I want you to see what happens if uh, uh, if we take n to be one. Uh, so, uh, if you take n to be, if you one component, the five fourth model looks like an e approximate easing model, because it it just allows the spins to fluctuate around minus one and plus one. Here's the theorem, first proved by Sakai for the Ising model in 2007, and then 2015 for the five fourth model for one component. And uh, the theorem I'm stating is slightly extended. And here are my two collaborators, Tyler Elmuth, who's at uh, University of Durham, and Mark Holmes, who is uh, at the University of Melbourne, but actually hanging out in Vancouver right now. <laughs> so um, if the dimension is greater than five and the number of components is either zero, one, or two, for small coupling constant and new critical, there is a constant CG such that the two-point function is asymptotic to the canonical two-point function as the distance between B and A extends to infinity. That's the, the wiggly asymptotic means that the ratio of the right-hand side to the left-hand side becomes one. And finiteness of new C is included. In principle, we know that it isn't. We know that there is a finite critical new for nearest neighbor models by other arguments. Uh, for not, not nearest neighbor models, uh, well, um, uh, the, the lace expansion proves something here. <laughs> Um, the proof, I'm sorry, the proof uses this correlation inequality, which is implied by Griffith 2. And we only know that for n equals 0 and 1. We don't know it for n greater than 2. Otherwise, we'd have this theorem for all that. Now, let's see, how, how am I doing here? Probably not very well. <clears throat> A second. Okay. So I guess it, I guess it, it's okay. Do not, it's okay, do not worry. Is, worry. It, is it okay for me to go on a little longer? I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, first I have to explain. Um, what did we actually do to prove this theorem? And this is what this page will explain. We extended the arguments I showed you for the weekly self-avoiding walk to walks which have very general self-interactions. Much more complicated self-interactions are allowed. I'm going to specify roughly what they are in a moment. Um, and then we, we, uh, we used a theorem uh, which is like the current representation for the Ising model, but it's a different way of introducing uh, paths connecting the two points A and B. Uh, which comes from semantic. And um, 
Uh, so what we do is we transform the spin model into a very complicated self-interacting walk model and then applied a generalized lace expansion to it. So I'm going to explain now how you transform it into a, a complicated self-interacting walk model. Here's the theorem. That, and, and this is true for any number of components, which is why we can get com two component models. The uh, expectation of, uh, I mean, the two-point function for the, for the, um, uh, for any of these models with any V here, I mean, any reasonable V, um, has to be bounded below, for example, and stuff like that. And, uh, the two-point function is equal to, um, there's an integral over the length of a walk. So we're going to have a, continuous time random walk called capital X. And I call L the length, but it just means the, la the, the walk, um, we look at the walk for times up to, up to this uh, L. The expectation over this continuous time walk, and then here's the interaction, Z sub tau over Z zero. Z0 is the standard partition function. And well, here, here you see what to do. When, when you put t equal to zero, that drops out. And we have the partition function for the spin model. But uh, on the top, we have Z with t replaced by, this t is replaced by local time, which I'll define, local time, for the continuous time random walk X. Local time is the time it spends, local time at X is the time it spends at X, um, which we get by indicate, we, in, we integrate over the time from zero to L of the uh, indicator function that uh, X actually is, capital X actually is at middle X. Uh, this is the, uh, uh, this goes, as I said, goes back to Semantic. Uh, this is a paper by me, Froelich and Spencer in 82. And then Dinkin uh, found a, a much cleaner way of, uh, of formulating it uh, and said, you we basically was saying we should have used continuous time rather than the discrete time that we wrote this uh, formula in. The lace expansion for general, uh, uh, so the, 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 what I'm about to say now, this is a particular, this particular Z here is defined this way, but you could have more or less any function of time for some of what I'm about to say. So this, fair, this could be just a, a smooth bounded positive function uh, map, uh, that assigns to uh, uh, this, uh, uh, boldface t variable some value, um, and it it um, the then you would then we would define a Green's function just by this formula. This is a definition. It depends on a and b. So a can be in lambda, b can be in lambda. Think of g a b as the as an entry in a lambda by lambda matrix. Now. Uh, there exists a series which, if it's convergent, defines a solution to this formula, which you saw before, except it had convolution in it. But we can't use convolution here because we're on a finite piece of the lattice. So um, instead of saying that G is a function of A minus B, I have to say it's a function of A comma B. And I have to use matrix multiplication instead of convolution. But it's the same idea. Okay, now uh, I just want to spend a few minutes showing you what a typical term in the pi. So when I say there exists a series, I'm going to tell you about the, this series a little bit. And at some point while I'm telling you about it, these things will appear. I've, we need to know a slight extension of the idea of local time 
where you only look at the time spent by the particle at little x within a time interval s comma t. Whereas before, I was looking at the whole interval for which the walk exists. Okay, so coming back to this, I'll tell you this will appear in a moment. Pi. Now, don't be take too much time trying to figure out what this is. Uh, there's an expectation over the random walk. There's a product of ratios of partition functions, but the local times are restricted to these intervals. And then there's this R, and this is R right there. Um, you see that R uh, depends, you, you do a, a derivative of this function with respect to this variable T at the site, at a random site XS. That's the site where the walk is at time S. And you differentiate twice, there's another derivative here. And after you finish doing the derivatives, you put the T equal to the local time in this interval. That's how you define R. You might see that if you put j equal to 1, uh, then um, uh, this s prime j minus 2 is an, a j is an s prime minus 1, which uh, won't appear in any of any of the equations. It's just by definition 0. Now, more importantly, what, um, what does this walk uh, actually do. The R's here are a little bit like the indicator functions of the lace which forced the walk to be at the same place at the same time. These blocks here represent a function of the position of the walk at time at this time, uh, which is uh, um, I, I'm sorry about putting this A in here. That's another uh, another typo. Um, these are times. I can't put it equal to the, the A is a site in the lattice. So just ignore that and, and ignore that too. Um, it's S naught zero e equals S naught equals zero. This is zero time. And this one is um, should have been s prime five equals s five equals l the other length the length the whole length of the or um, well actually s this is better just leave leave out sorry let me say this again omit the equals a omit the equals b then this is going to be right uh, uh, this will be all just fine <clears throat> um, so. Uh, the, coming back to these blocks, when you take the derivative of this log here, you get um, a, uh, for the 5 4 theory, you would get a delta function, delta xs minus xt, and you would get a correlation of phi squared at xs with phi squared at xt, a four-point function. So one hopes that that decays fairly rapidly. Um, and if it does, then it will cause this thing to be close to this. The delta function certainly does. It's the other part which you have to worry uh, about, the correlation function. We'll see that in a moment. But think of this as tying the position of the walk at this time to the position of the walk at this time. And likewise, all these other ones. So then it's actually very much like these diagrams back here um, very much like these diagrams. All that's happened is that each thing here became a, a bar, which became non-local. And there's a formula for what it is. So that's a lace. And um, here is the very complicated thing that uh, replaces all of those self-avoiding things. And... Um, the point is that you can bound this lace by, again, Green's functions. And here I'm showing you there's an upper bound on that um, uh, thick edge here. 
it's a g squared at two Greens functions. So that does decay much more rapidly, twice as fast as a standard Greens function. And uh, here is the delta function, the Kronecker delta. And all the laces are bounded in terms of g. So I can use the same argument as I did before for this simple for the self-avoiding walk bootstrap argument. And here is the last place. This I better stop here, but I'm just trying to tell you here that when you that this the mechanism we use for replacing. Here is the walk, and it should have reached the end. In the previous diagram, it reached the, the last point. But what I'm doing is I'm bounding the segment of the walk by a Green's function here. And the reason I can do it is right here. I can take a conditional expectation, conditioning on uh, uh, the time S prime four right here, I can just look at the ratio of, of partition functions, the last one in that formula in the previous page, and I can rewrite it. And then I can use the Markov property because of the way these factors of uh, Z, uh, I mean, the, the Markov property allows me, because of the way the lace expansion has been organized, to um, uh, hold fixed the whole walk up to that point, which is what you roughly intuitively what you mean by conditioning, and just integrate over this part and recognize it as a Green's function where there's a background. That's the local times of this part of the walk all the way up to that point there. That's what this that red thing is there. I recognize it as a Green's function, and then the Green's function for the 5-4 theory, I have to, I can only do this for the 5-4 theory, not for a general model. I can recognize the Green's function by using the uh, um, random walk representation backwards as a two-point function and use Griffiths to bound the two-point function by a standard Green's function without any background. That's what gives me this thing here and enables the whole argument to work. And I'm sorry I went so much over time. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Right. So thank you, David, right. so thank very, you much David very much for this beautiful, for talk. beautiful talk. Are there questions? Are there questions? So perhaps I have, so one, perhaps question. I have one question. So, so sorry, but there is a sound which is coming back. I'm not sure why. It, uh, um, a a question, right. but after you speak. Ah, so, mm -hmm. well, so my question is what was Green's functions? I sort of remember from the paper of Sakai that they were defined on different domains, and that was a bit of a technical problem. Is it also something that you have in the in the expansion? What was defined on different domains? Did you All say? those green functions for different legs in, in the in the graph corresponding to the uh, well, uh, I mean, in a sense, yes. Uh, um, I, I didn't. Uh, there was two two parts to your question. The way I'm interpreting it. This background local time is a kind of restriction on the domain because the walk does not want to, I mean, actually what we're using when we use that Griffiths inequality is a statement that on average the walk doesn't want to go over those, the places where the previous walk was. So uh, we don't have different domains uh, uh, in the sense of different lambdas. There's one lambda at any, at any stage in the expansion, there's only one lambda. Uh, of course, we have to take the infinite volume limit in the lambda. I never talked about that in what I just said. But this turned out to be amazingly easy, um, uh, actually. Uh, I mean, I, I was expecting that to be horrible, but it wasn't. Um, so I, I think the answer is uh, we don't have that problem. Okay, thanks. Michael? So uh, first, I, I would like to thank uh, David Bridges and the organizers for this uh, master uh, class. It's really beautiful uh, talk uh, on beautiful subject. Thank you. Then uh, a question. In the statement of the theorem, uh, if I read it correctly, uh, it states uh, that the propagator... The sorry? I'll just uh, get back to the theorem, yeah. Uh, um, the, the, yeah. Uh, yes. So, yeah, uh, this one. Uh, 
how much of rotation invariance is included in the results? Um, you mean rotation invariance in space or in... In, 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 in space. The, in space. How, much, how much do you... Uh, all, all of it. All of it is included in the sense that we, we, this is an infinite volume. Uh, this is a, a statement about the infinite volume Green's function. Um, and uh, um, we're using Dirichlet boundary conditions. So when you take the infinite volume limit through Dirichlet boundary conditions, uh, because it's monotone increasing, again, by the uh, one of these Griffiths inequalities, um, this uh, is, is known to be the, the symmetric Green's function in the infinite volume limit. And uh, it's asymptotic um, uh, to this. There's a, a correction which uh, uh, Takashihara would be able to tell me, but I didn't look into this. Uh, but the correction is a higher power in, in, than this. So, so do I understand correctly that this allows to prove that the scaling limit of uh, five fourth uh, in higher dimensions uh, is also rotation invariant? Uh, yes, thank you for that question. It does. Beautiful. And another thing it would do, by the way, is that there's unfinished business in three dimensions where uh, Froelich, uh, Sokol, and I uh, had a way to construct the three-dimensional massive uh, field theory. And... Um, we never could prove that that was Euclidean invariant, but I think this is a this will give a way to do that. I think so. I uh, um, uh, I have that as a list uh, as one of the very interesting problems that uh, someone could do uh, if I don't, uh, you know, I, I might not get around to it because I'm getting old. But uh, someone could do that. I think older and better. Uh, I have a question, David. It's yes. Erhard. Oh, um, hi, Erhard. Yes. Hi. No, I got in late. Sorry. No, I just mm -hmm. a very naive question. Is are you in the spontaneously broken phase here? No, uh, we cannot reach. Uh, so uh, we we cannot discuss the uh, spontaneously broken f uh, phase by this lace expansion method. But I did. The, it, I do have a, a double well potential. It's just not double well enough to be uh, okay. um, spontaneously broken. So that, of course, would be a wonderful thing to do, but I don't know how to do that. So the internal symmetry is unbroken here in that phase. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there further questions? No other questions? Okay, so we can stop the, the record.